want to go to our New Testament reading, which is found in the book of Mark. It's Mark chapter 4. And this is a wonderful passage about Jesus teaching his disciples about overcoming the spirit of fear. So what happens is in the uh, scriptures here, Jesus is that the disciples are in a big storm where there's water coming into the boat and the boat is sinking. If, the water, if water gets into a boat, are you going to live? No, you're going to die. I think this is justifiable fear, but is it? When we read the scripture, we're going to see that Jesus says, no, it's not justifiable. He says, no, we're supposed to put our faith and trust in him. And he rebukes the disciples for their fear. He rebukes them for their lack of faith that Jesus has the power to protect them no matter what situation we're in. And so we want to give, uh, so when we see this, we see that Jesus says uh, to his disciples that the reason why they ran into fear is because they had little faith and that we have to increase our faith to get rid of our fears. And I, just something that you don't see in the uh, English, uh, in verse 40, when it says, why are you afraid? That verse, uh, that Greek word is delos, which means uh, an enslaving fear. Uh, the word for slave in Greek is doulos. And so that's an enslaving type of fear. That's a bad fear. But when you go to the next verse, verse 41, they become very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and seas obey him? That fear is phobias. That's the good fear. That's the fear of the Lord. That's the healthy fear that we're all supposed to try to have so that we do right before the Lord. Let us go ahead and hear the word of God. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let us pray. Father, we just ask you to help us to understand your word. We pray you'd pour your spirit out, that you would show us how to be strengthened in our faith, that we would live stronger lives, that our joy would be full, that we would live the abundant life that you have called us to. In your holy name we pray, amen. Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever experienced that gripping fear that paralyzes you? That fear that makes your heart race as you think about the possible outcomes? What if I'm rejected? What if I fail to meet up to expectations? What if I offend or hurt or bother those people? Have you ever feared change or the unknown? Fear of messing up, the fear of letting God down, the fear of man, when God is small and man is big. Are you afraid to share the gospel, the good news to offer to others lest they reject you and hurt you? How many of us are afraid to use politically correct language? If we don't say it just right, people are going to get upset. It's very fascinating when you look at the book of Jude. Jude 3, it's the verse that's uh, before the song, Faith of Our Fathers. In, in Jude 3, it says this. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Why did Jude have to exhort the people of God to contend for the faith? It's because they weren't doing it. Why weren't they doing it? Could it be that they were afraid? That word contend, it sounds like agony. And it's very agonizing to contend for the faith, isn't it? They have to do the hard things. And it's interesting that that, that word contend, uh, in the Greek, in the noun form, it means a bull. And all the Greek arenas where they contended, where they went into battle to fight, to win the contest, like the Olympics, they were all in bulls. And what a message for us, that God's called us to contend, to fight. It's interesting when uh, you see God change the name of Jacob, he changes it to Israel. 
Israel means God fights. So God fights for us and he wants us to fight as well. Fight against the flesh, fight against the devil, fight against Satan. And so we have to be able to contend. There was a time in my life, and I want to encourage all you college students. Uh, there was a, I'm sure many times you guys are in the college campus room and you hear something that's wrong and God calls you to contend for the faith. And you have to battle these fears. I know it happened to me at USC. It was back in the late 80s, early 90s. I was there in a political science class. I was a political science major. And there I am in, in the front row, and we're in a big lecture hall, and the professor says, Jesus is not God, nor did he claim to be God. And immediately the Holy Spirit prompted me and said, raise your hand. You, you can't let that stand. And I went halfway up, and then I looked back, and I saw all these people, and I said, I can't do that, God. Fear struck my heart. I can't contend for the faith, Lord. And then I said, okay, I'll go up afterwards, and I'll talk to him. And for whatever reason, there was a huge line there, and I couldn't talk to the professor. And I was like, okay, I got to go and laugh. And I just felt guilty. I just was not at peace. I felt like I let God down. I felt like I let fear grip my heart, and I didn't follow this biblical principle. I didn't contend for the faith. So I called my dad. My dad was a pastor, a very godly man. And he says, well, son, you know, God's a God of redemption. And uh, there's a chance to make this right. And so I want you to memorize a verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. Uh, I happen to memorize it where it said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. The New American Standard says, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. And what that verse is saying is that, that cowardly fear, that being timid to not stand strong in the gospel, to not contend for the faith, that God says we have to overcome it. And so I memorized the word. I, I got the verse down. Then my dad said, all right, go, go to office hours and talk to the professor. And I um, was majoring more in football than athletics, so I didn't know what office hours were. But I figured it out, and I went to office hours, and I talked to the pastor, I mean the professor, and I laid out uh, the passage where Jesus at least claimed to be God. And he got all mad at me and said, who do you think you are lecturing me, a professor? You're just a mere student. And I said, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I started crying, and I left. And then I was well worried that I did something wrong. Doesn't that happen to you? Where if things don't go right, you think you let God down, you think you did something wrong. And so I thought I did something wrong. And I said, oh, I, I probably was proud. I, I probably didn't do it right. You know, because if I did it right, it all worked out, right? I mean, the wicked won't get upset at you when you tell the truth, right? So I went back to apologize. And when I apologized, uh, God had done a work in the professor's heart. And he lowered his glasses and said, son, no apology needed. You're a scholar. God doesn't always move in people's hearts. But when you're faithful, sometimes he does. And that was a strong principle that I had to learn. That no matter what we face, a new job, going to college for the first time, confronting a friend, standing alone among your colleagues, it is Satan, our flesh, the world, who uses fear to grip, grip, cripple us, to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. It's those fiery darts we must fight. Here we see that this fiery dart is something that Jeremiah had to be trained in had to be faced. And so we need to be trained in. Now, obviously, the first cause or the, the exact interpretation is first the pastors, right? Because Jeremiah is a prophet of God. And so therefore, this is an exhortation to pastors. The pastors need to be bold. They need to do exactly what God tells them to do. We're not to be afraid. And so that is some training uh, uh, that's directly to pastors. But it's also to all of us. All of us have callings. We're all called to be Christians. We're all called to stand. We're all called to share the gospel and be ministers uh, un unto um, those who need Christ. And so all of us need to work on understanding uh, these principles. When we see this concept in verse 8, when he says, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. That is one of 366 times in the Bible. 366 times. Now, I used to think it was 365 times, but I, I heard an interview of Pastor Richard Wormbrand. If you know him, he started Voice of the Martyrs. And this was the very truth that carried him through many years of being persecuted under the communists. And he said, this truth, the reason why God has it 366 times is because of leap year. And it's such an important principle for us to get down that he tells us 366 times that we must not be afraid. 
If you look at verse 17, we see the same message. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. Here we see an important truth to help us overcome our fears. It's God's love. The fear exterminator. God will deliver you. He is with you. If you know who you are in Christ, God's love for you, that you are precious to him. It's an amazing love that he has chosen you, that you are special, and he has a purpose for your life, and he is doing the work in you. And we simply have to trust him. He will give you the strength. When Jeremiah says, oh, I'm just a child. I can't do this, Lord. Aren't all of us there? We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it. And Jeremiah's right. He can't do it. But then God said, no, don't say you're a child. You're a child of God. I'm going to be your strength. I'm going to be the one that's going to help you overcome. I'm going to strengthen you and take you through. And you will be able to stand. Because this is the amazing love that God has for you. He has chosen you for a special purpose. Look at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That word know is that intimate knowledge, like Adam knew Eve. It's the idea that in Ephesians 1, it says, I knew you before the foundations of the world. That is knowing. It's, it's, a, it's a type of choosing and love how much God loves us, and we rest in that because he has ordained us for such a time as this to carry out his will. Now also, if you remember, I got this insight from Pastor Brian. God doesn't always just help us overcome our fear through the soft side of love by increasing our faith, by knowing that God's with us, but also through the hard side of love. Fear removes fear. What a concept. The phobias removes the day loss. The fear of the Lord removes the enslaving fear. Look at verse 17. He says, lest I confound thee. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to confound thee. I'm going to dismay thee before thee. If you disobey me for your own good, I will chasten you. I'll spank you. Fear me, not men. I love the Geneva Bibles from 1599. It was uh, put together by uh, the disciples of John Calvin in Geneva. John Knox was the main one. And they have all these wonderful footnotes in the Geneva Bible. And this is what the Geneva Bible says in the footnote. It says, Which declareth that God's vengeance is prepared against them which dare not execute their duty faithfully, either for fear of man or for any other cause. God uses the carrot and the stick. Isn't that just how we disciple our children? They're, they're positive. Hey, if you do this, I'm going to reward you. But if you don't do this, uh, you're going to have consequences. And the Lord works the same way with us. He says, I'm going to motivate you by saying, hey, I'm going to be with you. I love you. I bless you. I'm going to give you the strength. But if you still give into the flesh, you still not do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to chasten you. Verse 18 and 19. We see the carrot. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. That fortified city. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you're a fortified city? This is what Martin Luther held on to in Psalm 46 when he wrote that great song, A Mighty Fortress in Our God, when Martin Luther had to stand against the Catholic Church and all their corruptions. At the very, he knew his life was lonely. He knew he was going to get put to death for the stand that he was taking. And he dwelt on this and said, no, I will be loyal to Christ because he is my refuge and strength, a very present help in, 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 in times of trouble. Therefore, I will not be afraid. And then you see in verse 19, they will fight against you. All the enemies of God will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. God loves you. He protects you. He'll defeat his enemies. And when you watch Jeremiah's life, everyone tried to kill him, destroy him, but no one could. Not until the proper time. And I think this is, a, this is an important principle. That a lot of times we fall into this, um, I want to call it the health and wealth gospel. That every time you think, 
God's not with you if he, if he puts you through a hard time or he allows you to die or, or those things. And that's not true, right? We don't say, oh, James, the son of Zebedee, when he got beheaded by Herod, oh, he must have done something wrong or, oh, he wasn't blessed by God. No, he was faithful. He did what was right. Yes, he ended up being beheaded. But that was God's time for him. He was a martyr's death. And that's why we don't fear death. This is what, what in the Civil War, Stonewall Jackson was known for raising his hands in battle. And they said, well, why do you do this? He goes, because I have no fear. God's going to take me when it's, when it's his time. No one, no bullet can hit me unless it's the right time. And so he had this great confidence, and he was very successful. God very much blessed him. This is what the Hebrew boys had in, in, in Babylon. They're in captivity. They're told, worship down at, the, at Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And they don't. They refuse. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, what are you thinking? I don't want to have to kill you, but I am. Why are you doing this? And they said, look, our God has the power to save us. But if he chooses not to, meaning if it's our time to die, if it's our time, if God chooses for us to have a martyr's death, then know this, that there are those who will not bow down to you and worship a false god. We will be loyal to the one true God. And that's the truth that God wants each of us to live in. He wants us to live in that faith, that victory, that we are his. No one can touch us unless God says they can. And at that point, when God says they can, there has to be a reason to go through it. Remember when David was fleeing from Absalom and he had that guy persecuting him and saying all those insults to him? And he goes, well, you know, no, don't go out, don't kill him. You know, God's using this for a purpose. He's refining my character. There's a reason for it. Everything happens for a purpose. And when we have that understanding, when we have that worldview, it makes us stronger to live for the Lord. There's a verse that really helped me out. Um, in high school, I had a difficult football coach. I, uh, he was just very mean. I didn't understand why. Um, and I, I, I kept memorizing this verse in Proverbs 29, 25. It said, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. And I had to, because I was afraid of him, and I, I had to keep memorizing and meditate. No, I have to trust the Lord. He's going to carry me through. One, 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 just to give you an idea of one of the instance, what happened there was uh, he pulls me aside out of, a, out of a, um, a drill, and I was doing offense and defense at the time, and he says, um, he called me Brownie. So he said, you know, Brownie, um, I was at a Bible study last night, and I was shocked because he has a mouth of a sailor. You know, you'd never know that, that he, he, he went to Bible study. And, uh, and he goes, well, well, well Brownie, um, it was very interesting. I, I learned that King David, a man after God's heart, committed adultery and didn't seem like it was a big deal. And I said, well, no, coach, uh, you really need to read the Psalms. This is written by David too, and you see his heart of repentance. That, yeah, we all struggle with the flesh, we all fell, but God isn't okay with adultery. He's, he, we have to repent of those sins. And he got all mad and said, Bernie, get back in that drill. And the next day, I got taken off the offense. I was only on the defense. And I had to struggle. I struggled with bitterness. I struggled with hurt. But it wasn't until I found out what had happened that gave me a heart of compassion we don't know what's going on in people's lives. We don't know why. Remember, when you represent God, people aren't angry at you necessarily. They're angry at God. And I found out that um, my beloved coach who was single, I didn't know why he was single, um, that uh, he had everything going for him. He grew up in a Christian home. He had everything going. He was the state champion wrestler. He was, uh, I think, playing football at Cal Berkeley. I mean, he, he, he was the top of everything. The day he was going to get married, his fiance dies in a car accident. And he just got full of bitterness. Couldn't forgive God. I didn't know that. But the greatest thing was, I don't know if you've ever learned this technique, that when you struggle with sin, that Satan's tempting you with bad thoughts, you start praying for someone who'd be mighty in the kingdom if they became a Christian. So I started praying for my coach. And the Lord heard those prayers. And uh, my beloved coach became a Christian. And he's passed on in the glory now. But it was exciting. The Lord turned his life around and it was beautiful. So you never know what God's doing in your lives or the lives of others. And the key is that we try to learn these principles and not give in to fear. This is such an important principle we see in 1 Chronicles 28, 20. Then David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Here's David exhorting his son. He's passing the baton. And saying what? Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Do what's right. When we look at what Jesus did in ministering to his disciples, 
here they were. They've, they've gone in this intense weeks. They've had three weeks of ministering. Jesus just taught the parable of the soil and the seed. And they're all getting on this boat. Jesus is tired, right? He's fully God, fully man. His fully man side says, I'm tired. I'm, I'm sleeping. Of course, the fully God side never sleeps, never slumbers. And here he was fast asleep. And here are the disciples. These I think four of them are professional fishermen. They are on their turf. They are on this boat, on the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden a storm comes. I, I, I wonder if part of the training is to help humble us, that when we're gifted or something's really good, God has to humble us, to help us to be receptive, to grow. Because here he brings this storm in, and here these are professional. They, they face storms all the time. But this storm brought them to the place of total despondency. They thought they were going to die. So what do they do? They wake up, Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. And what does Jesus say to them? Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? He's saying they're walking in the flesh. I'm like, but Lord, that, isn't it normal to get fearful when you're about to die? I mean, that sounds like a legitimate fear. But he's saying no. He's saying we should have such confidence that Christ is with us no matter where we go that we should not fear death no matter what situations we're in. You calmly do what you need to do to try to save the life. You bail out that water, but you know Christ is with you. And Christ was obviously there. They fully obviously did not understand he was God because that's why they feared afterwards. Whoa, even the sins, when he said, come up and says, peace be still, even the sins and the, wa- and the seas and the waves obey him. Isn't this the principle when he sends them out in the Great Commission? He says, lo, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Jesus is with you and me, just like those disciples. He might not be physically lying on the bed right there, but he's with us spiritually. There's a saying that Christ is the unseen guest in every room. And that's truth. No matter where we are, he is right here with us. We might not be able to see him. It's invisible. But he is real. He is there. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He helps us to be able to do this. There's the story of how John Wesley uh, became a Christian. And it was this very truth that the Moravians were following that led him to Christ. John Wesley, here he was, grew up in a Christian family, yet didn't know Christ. Became an Anglican pastor, yet didn't know Christ. He went to become a missionary over, he, he grew up in England, went to America, to Georgia, to witness as a missionary didn't know Christ. On the trip back, he's in a boat and going back across to England, and a huge storm hits. And he's afraid. He's like, we're all going to die. And he looks over at these Moravian Christians. He's like, they're not afraid. They're all singing a psalm. He's like, what's going on? Even their kids aren't even afraid. I don't get this. What is going on here? So he goes and asks the pastor, and and the pastor explains this principle and says, God tells us not to be afraid. God's with us. There's nothing we can do to save this. Everyone had it under control. If we were to perish, then we're to perish. It's our time to go. We're fully at peace, and our children are at peace. And that's how God wants us to live our lives. Not to be fearful of that, but to have that right fear of that understanding of the fear of the Lord that keeps us sober-minded and keeps us working uh, for the Lord. I mentioned Richard and Sabina Wormbrand earlier, and uh, they, they have an amazing testimony. I, 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 I just go, wow, these were really strong Christians. And I, I see the weakness of my own fl- flesh. I mean, my struggles with fear and anxiety, I, I just, I'm not there yet. And I look at their story, and I say, for, first of all, if you don't know their story, they were Jews uh, in their young 20s, and um, they had some health problems. And then someone led them to the Lord and they became Christians. And they then started ministering there in Romania. And first under Nazi Germany, they were helping rescue Jews and they got uh, beat up a few times, but the Lord continued to protect them, preserve their life. Well, then after that, the war ended. Then the communists came in, the Russians came in in 1945. And all of a sudden they thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to witness. And he was very bold. He would go, and, and there was a bunch of soldiers, and he'd come, and he'd, he'd be showing a watch, like pretending like from the people looking in that he was talking about selling the watch. But in reality, he'd share Christ with them. He wasn't afraid. The communists weren't very 
agreeable to Christianity, but what he found was those Russian soldiers were hungry for the things of God, were hungry to understand the love of Christ. And he was bold. He didn't have the fear. It was funny, the, they would talk about how the government would start making it illegal to have church meetings. So they would go meet at a park and celebrate a birthday every Sunday. So that when the police came, they'd say, oh yeah, we're celebrating Johnny's birthday. He would, I think he handed out a million uh, gospel tracts, and he would disguise them as uh, Russian propaganda when, 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 uh, when he would give it to the soldiers. There's all these creative ways that God does uh, when we're faithful to him, when we overcome fear uh, to, to be able to share the gospel. And the, the biggest thing on when he became a, uh, a target of the communists, when he became an enemy, was when the communist government had brought all the pastors together. There was about 4,000 that attended. It was on the radio. And priest after priest got up, pastor after pastor got up, and they told their fellow clergies how they obtained light from Stalin and the communists and what freedom they enjoyed. And all of a sudden, Mrs. Wormbrand says to Mr. Wormbrand says, um, you need to get up there and speak and wipe this face, this, 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 this horrible uh, blemish off of Christ's face. Uh, this is just not right. And he went up. He had the boldness. He had the faith to get up there. And he proclaimed truth. He said, wait a second, brothers and sisters, communism has killed, has martyred many of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do not listen to these lies. And he told the truth, of course. He became a marked man after that. And this is the thing that um, I find that when we meditate on these scriptures, when we think about this, that these are sometimes some of the things that we're challenged to, to be able to look at, look at the faith of our fathers, the faith they had. We look at biblical faith of all the Christians throughout the ages. We look at our historical faith of the Christian faith. We look at modern day of someone like a Pastor Wormbrand because he ended up being uh, thrown into, you know, eventually got picked up by uh, the police and was persecuted and tortured over and over again. But he said that the main message that carried him through all those years of suffering was that Jesus loved him and he had a purpose for it. And that God tells us 366 times, do not be afraid. May that rest in our hearts. May that give us encouragement. And may we stand for him. Let us pray.